Hello, my name is Fran Stoddard, and I'll be your host for today's program. The Orton Family Foundation, in partnership with the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts, brings you today's event on creative placemaking and economic development for the next generation with Zachary Mannheimer. Zach will share his fresh approach to economic development in small towns with young people and creative professionals in mind. He will explore creating attractive communities with viable business models, enthusiastic investors, and dynamic programs. We have over 1,200 reg registrants for our webinar today from all over North America and beyond. Due to this high interest, many registrants had to be put on a wait list, but everyone will be able to enjoy a recording of this webinar. It's always a good idea to sign up early to enjoy it live, and we welcome those of you that have, um, are on live at the moment. Adobe Connect platform allows us to share Zach's visuals. Be sure that you click on that link to follow along. Some of the capabilities will be limited due to our high numbers. Participants are muted to get as clean an audio signal as possible, and you won't be able to raise your hand, but we can take your questions. We, um, we hope you also take our survey at the end. Many questions have already been submitted for, from today's, for today's webinar, and we want to thank you. Our speaker has reviewed them, and many will be answered during his presentation. We'll get to other submitted questions during the Q&A period following Zach's presentation. There will also be an opportunity for you to add questions during and after his presentation in the Q&A box if you are on live. You can see all the people from all over on that map. I think that's terrific that we put that up. So we'll get to as many of your questions as possible during our hour-long program. If you're having any technical problems, you can dial star zero for phone issues or email Caitlin Davison at cdavison at orton.org. And I believe that that number, that address is going up on your screen right now. So let's get on with the webinar. A little introduction first. After a road trip from New York City to 22 cities around the country a decade ago, Zachary Mannheimer chose and settled in Des Moines, Iowa, where he founded the Des Moines Social Club, an arts and educational nonprofit. Focused on the retention and recruitment of young people, the Social Club uses the arts as a catalyst to create unprecedented community engagement. Since opening its doors in 2009, Zachary has raised over $14 million, and the club has hosted over 5,000 arts-related events for over a million patrons. He was awarded the 2011 Des Moines Citizen of the Year Award, among many other impressive recognitions that prove how valuable he is to the state of Iowa. He has also been featured in many articles in the national press. Last year, Zachary began a new position at Iowa Business Growth as the Vice President of Creative Placemaking and recently moved to McClure Engineering Company as their Principal Community Planner. As if that's not enough, Zachary also co-owns Proof Restaurant in downtown Des Moines and is raising three children with his wife, Sarah. Welcome, Zach, and take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is my first ever webinar where I can't see or hear you, so that should be interesting. So I'm going to, if I tell some jokes and they're not funny, uh, my apologies up front. Um, so I'm going to talk about creative placemaking and what it is I do and what it is that I do here in Iowa, but uh, I'm beginning to do work nationally, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. But first, a little bit about myself. Uh, as Fran said, I, I'm originally from the East Coast. I grew up outside Philadelphia. And uh, after college, I lived in London for a few years and then was in New York City, where I ran theaters and restaurants. And I quickly realized that New York didn't need any more theaters or restaurants. They were pretty good on those. Uh, I wanted to go to a smaller market. I wanted to go somewhere where I could have more of an impact and that place could have more of an impact on me. And when I lived in Brooklyn, I felt that I was living in a bubble. And everybody around me thought the same way, dressed the same way, ate the same way. And uh, I didn't feel that that was very healthy for myself. And I wanted to get out and go somewhere else, but I wasn't sure where. So I decided to do a road trip. Uh, this is a map of the uh, towns I went to over the summer of 2007. I visited 22 cities. I visited each city for about three to five days. Uh, I was looking for cities in particular that had roughly half a million people in the metro, uh, that had a downtown that needed to be revitalized, that had issues with retaining and recruiting young people, uh, that had an art scene that was burgeoning but not yet established on a national scale. And Des Moines, Iowa checked all of my boxes. 
Uh, I didn't know anybody in the state of Iowa when I moved here. Uh, I moved here a day after my 30th birthday in September of 07 and got started. And I first took a job as the maitre d' of the Embassy Club, which is a private supper club where a lot of the wealthy individuals in town go that was purposeful. I got to meet several of them, and they helped me secure a few grants up front to start what became the Des Moines Social Club. And that was the goal of coming here uh, initially, was to start this organization. Initially, the idea was simply going to be a black box theater and a restaurant and bar, since that was what I knew. Uh, it quickly ballooned into a lot more. Uh, this is just a, a sort of scale look of what is inside the social club. It's a 37,000 square foot facility inside an Art Deco firehouse that was built in 1937. Uh, we purchased the building from the city of Des Moines and put it on the National Registry and used historic tax credits, amongst many other uh, funding mechanisms, to restore the space. Um, the goal is to blend worlds. We also wanted to have uh, every single artistic discipline represented. Uh, here's a quick look at some of the numbers of what the Social Club does today. Uh, they see over 300,000 people a year come through its doors. They produce over 800 different events every year, and uh, every single artistic discipline is represented. But I want to tell you a quick story about how we got here. And initially, we, the first ever social club was not in this beautiful firehouse. It was in a falling apart building uh, just outside downtown Des Moines. At the time, that area was not developed. And this building was held together by dirt, and we loved every piece of that dirt, but it was uh, certainly not ideal. Uh, inside, we built an art gallery, a bar with a cabaret stage, a black box theater, and two educational classrooms. And the first group that ever came to rent our space was a group called 3X Wrestling. Uh, 3X Wrestling is a WWE-style local wrestling group, uh, not to ruin it for anybody, but it's fake, and uh, very much like theater, and we never anticipated that wrestling would be in our theater, but they could pay rent, so we said yes. So they started renting our space every first Friday to do their wrestling event. Now, as you might imagine, there are very specific types of people that come to see wrestling. Uh, on the same evening, completely coincidentally, in the bar, we booked a jazz and poetry night. And as you might imagine, there are very specific types of people to come see jazz and poetry. These two worlds would never be caught dead socializing together. And what happened the first month, uh, as we expected, they, two groups came in. You could basically tell who was going to see what based on what they were. The bar ran off to the theater. The poets went to the, uh, the bar stage, and they largely avoided each other. The next month, the same thing happened. But the third month, something really interesting happened, and this was the seed for every little piece of what the social club does today, as well as the work that I'm trying to do today in creative placemaking. Uh, on the third month of this event, the wrestlers were into the bar. They were on their intermission. They were getting running back, but there were these two guys that were watching the wrestling that were standing about five feet away from me, and they were drinking a beer and watching the poetry. And they suddenly turned to me, and they said, hey, are you the guy who runs this place? And I said, yeah. And they asked if they could talk to me in private, and I said, sure. We sat down in my office. I asked what I could do for them, and they said, well, we'd like to get more involved. I said, well, that's great. Uh, we've got several different volunteer opportunities. We're a nonprofit. And they said, yeah, we have something else in mind. And they looked around to make sure nobody was listening, and they whispered, we both write poetry. And then they asked if they could read their poems at the club. And I said, well, sure. It's an open mic. Anybody can. And thus began our wrestling and poetry evenings. So these two very brave wrestlers, are, uh, wrestling attendants, the next month came to watch the wrestling, and then at intermission they came out, they got up on stage, they read a couple of their poems, which were actually pretty good, and they went back in to watch the wrestling some more. The month after that, the people watching the wrestling came out to watch the poetry at first. A month later, the poets, encouraged by this behavior, said, well, we should probably uh, go check out what they do. And they came in to watch the wrestling, and they came out saying, this is awesome. Ten months in, we had to change the times of the program so people could attend both. Now, this was during the 2008 caucuses. And for those of you who have been in Iowa during the caucus season, it's uh, utter chaos. And so we had largely Republicans and Democrats sitting in a bar till 2 in the morning that had come down because of the catalyst of these two events, having the most organic, natural conversation about politics that you could ever want to hear. So uh, we stood back and we said, you know, this is it. We need to replicate this model every single evening as often as we can. And so today we try to do two different events 
that draw as opposite worlds as possible down to the social club. And this is what the work that I largely took on to continue doing. When I left the social club uh, at the end of 2015, it was to continue doing work in, uh, in Iowa, but I wanted to look at two different types of worlds. And it wasn't just wrestlers and poets anymore. It was more about what I've seen increasingly happen, not just in Iowa, but nationally, which is the uh, sort of battle between urban and rural. And Iowa has a major problem with this. Uh, there are not many suburban areas in Iowa. It is mostly either urban or rural. And we're seeing urban areas fill up very quickly and rural areas decline. And these two worlds do not work together. They certainly don't socialize together. So I began to think of how can we begin to bring these people together. And so I, uh, as Fran said, I went to a company called Iowa Business Growth as their uh, vice president of creative placemaking, which I, I started that organization there. And then I recently, as recent as Monday, uh, moved over to McClure Engineering Company to become their principal community planner. And that's where I am now. And so here's a high level of what the creative placemaking world is that I do at the moment. So it basically boils down to this. Instead of uh, giving away millions of dollars of tax incentives to large companies or, or manufacturing companies, uh, that would create 30, 40, 50, 60 jobs in rural areas, which is fine to do, but they, the return on that is very low. Not that we should stop doing that, but in, in, in addition to that, how do we revitalize our downtowns? How do we make these towns more attractive for young people to live? And that's the problem I've been hearing again and again, and I'm sure many of you have these issues as well. So in particular, every single community in Iowa, and I would argue probably in the country, especially rural communities, have two major problems right off the bat, workforce development and housing stock. It's, it's almost the opposite of urban areas. Some, most of them have jobs, but they have no one to take. And even if they had people to take the jobs, there's nowhere for them to live. Because if you think about a young person that's moving to a community of this size, they are not looking to stay for the rest of their lives at that moment, and so they're not going to take out a 30-year mortgage. They want a modern rental apartment. And at least in Iowa, those virtually don't exist. And I'll talk more about how to create those later. Um, but if you're going to make a town interesting, it has to be unique. And the only way, in my opinion, to create the unique is through the arts, through entrepreneurial concepts, through athletics, through something that makes that community unique. And it's the first question I ask to any community I go to. I ask, what makes you unique? And in many communities, regardless of their size, especially small towns, they'll say, well, we have small town charm. And that might be true, but a lot of communities have small town charm. Or they'll say, well, we're by a river, or we've got um, this one uh, really interesting historical aspect to it. Uh, all of these things are true, but they don't necessarily make the town unique. And so I work on how to create the unique. But when you boil it down, you know, what do young people want? How do you get them to stay there? And how do you get young people to move there? There's three things. If you ask any young person what they want in a town, they want mountains, they want oceans, and professional sports teams. Now, those three things are terrific, but many, especially in Iowa, rural areas, do not have any of these three and will never have any of these three unless global warming gets really bad. So when you, when you get past those three things in particular, <clears throat> you boiled it down to these five things that young people are looking for. They want an active cultural scene. They want great public transportation. They want strong parks and recreation. They want good jobs, and they want there to be an entrepreneurial culture. And what's interesting is that the jobs part of this tends to be lower on the scale of what young people are looking for. <clears throat> Myself in particular, I moved to New York when I was 22. I didn't have a job. I didn't move there for a job. I moved to New York because I wanted to be in New York, period. And that's the metric that these communities are going to have to figure out whether or not they're having success in terms of migration. So this is a list of several things that larger communities tend to have. Uh, larger cities definitely have all of these things. But these are the things that young people are looking for when they're trying to look at what, why, how, could they live in this town? Do they want to stay in this town? If they get a job, that's great. Do they have a relationship there? That's great. But what is going to keep them there? This is, this is certainly not everything, but this is a list of a lot of things young people are looking for. And specifically, when you talk about the unique, it's all about amenities. And if you're going to attract creative folks, 
you have to have these items there. You don't have to have all of them, but as many of them that you can have are beneficial. This is what they're looking for. And so I work on trying to build these things. So let me give you a, a real-world example here. We've got the city of Fort Dodge. Fort Dodge is uh, 25,000 people. It's about an hour and a half north of Des Moines. And Fort Dodge has had a very history of, of ups and downs in terms of their uh, economy, but mostly the population there has gone down over the last century, but not dramatically. They've hung somewhere between 20 and 30,000 people this entire time. So not a ton of growth. They have this building right in the middle of downtown Fort Dodge. This is the Warden Plaza Hotel. It is right smack in the middle of downtown. It is 260,000 square feet, and it has been vacant for over 25 years. And this is obviously a large problem. A large uh, a entire generation of folks in Fort Dodge grew up and went past this building every day, and it became sort of a symbol of what Fort Dodge was becoming. So they brought me on to figure out what do we do with this building. This is a massive task, and this is a, an anomaly. There aren't the, too many buildings of this size and communities of this size that are still standing that are vacant. So we didn't want it to tear it down. It's a beautiful historic building. So what do we do with it? So options quickly came up as I began to interview uh, the community in Fort Dodge. And, and they, like everywhere else, had an issue with housing stock. Uh, so certainly putting some residential units on the upper floors made sense. Could it become a boutique hotel? Uh, there was a need to build a new recreation center that they wanted, an 80,000-square-foot rec center. Uh, there's a big cultural community. Uh, Fort Dodge has a big theater community, uh, uh, and it's done, I believe it has the longest-running musical theater program in their high school, their public high school in the country. And so there's a decent uh, arts-related group that are in there, and they wanted some space because they didn't have a lot. Fort Dodge could use another restaurant or two. They could use a coffee shop. They could use some retail. So how do you put all this together? So then it became how do we pay for it? When we added all this up, it became a $60 million project. And that seems incredibly daunting right off the bat. So we began to become get creative in how we do this. And so it boils down to there's roughly $20 million in historic tax credits that are available, both state and federal. There's a brownfield tax credit and workforce credit of a million bucks. New market tax credits could be worth up to four million. The city's going to have to get on board and do a bonding of about $10 million. The uh, developer who we're talking to about taking over the building is going to need to put their own equity into it. And when you add all that up, you're still about $8 million short. And that's typically where these projects fail, is we don't know how to get that $8 million, in this case of a $60 million project. And so my role became after we uh, wrote the business model for what this is going to become, now it's finding that missing $8 million, as well as putting together the rest of this capital stack. But that's how we make this project work. And at the end of the day, we're going to have 80 to 90 brand new residential units. We're going to have a new rec center with two pools and a basketball court. And we're going to have a cultural center with a black box theater and art gallery and classrooms, plus a restaurant and some retail. And that is going to be a catalytic project for that area. On a smaller scale, because that's a big one, uh, I want to tell you about the town of Earlham. Earlham is about 1,400 people, and it is about a 30 to 40-minute drive west of the Des Moines metro. So almost half of Earlham's population commute to Des Moines every day. Uh, this is a picture of their downtown, uh, and the building, the biggest building there on the corner is called the Bricker Price Building. And a local person who, has, who owned a farm nearby uh, knew that that building needed to become something else, and so she bought it, but, and she wanted to turn it into something that would be catalytic. There's one restaurant in Earlham. Uh, it's a really nice bar and grill, but it's certainly not a place that you would go with your family. And so we wanted to create a family-style restaurant that was as farm-to-table as possible. And so we began interviewing the community and figuring this out, and a few things we realized right off the bat. Number one, the restaurant, yes, everybody was for that. They wanted it to be affordable, accessible, and so on. Um, they, I'll come back to number two in a minute, uh, they wanted a place to take culinary classes. A lot of places want culinary classes, but it's expensive to build, and it often sounds better than it actually does. Not everyone always takes the classes, but there was such a strong demand here, and we partnered with the local high school that it made a ton of sense. In addition, they, had, they needed a place for teenagers to hang out. Uh, a lot of parents were concerned that their teenagers were driving into West Des Moines every evening to hang out because there was nothing fun to do in Earlham, and maybe they drink, and it's not very safe, and they're driving back. And so there were major concerns there. 
So how do we create a hangout space? And of course, if you say, hey, kids, we're going to make a hangout space, no teenagers will show up. So instead, we went to the high school. We're talking with the students there, and they are designing their own space exactly how they want it, and we have them on a budget, and they're working through that right now. The second thing on here, the Pick Up and Go Cafe, this was incredibly interesting. When we asked, uh, we never thought breakfast would be a viable uh, option for this project, for this restaurant. And what we realized was we talked about what they said they wanted a coffee shop. And I asked, where do they get their coffee in the morning? And they said the Casey's. And if you don't know Iowa or the Midwest, Casey's is a glorified gas station and general store. And it's right by the interstate, and so everyone would stop, get their coffee, and drive to work. And they've been doing that for over a decade, so it's going to be hard to break that habit. So we said, well, what would make you break that habit? And they said, well, having it be done quicker. Because at the Casey's, they've got to drive there, they've got to stop, they've got to get out of their car, make their coffee, chat with whoever they see there, which inevitably will happen, uh, wait in line, pay for it, and go. It's a 15 to 20-minute process. If we could make that faster, that'd be great. The downtown space was not built for a drive through so instead – Somebody in the visioning session brought up, well, could we order it online prior and prepay for it, similar to how Panera Bread does it, and stick it on a countertop and we'll run in and get it. And that's exactly what we're doing. And so that ended up working out wonderfully, and that was an idea generated specifically from the community that was there. So what I do, this is a list of a bunch of things I do, but uh, at any level I can come into a community, but if we're starting from scratch, it's based on a cultural assessment where we figure out what is the community doing now to attract and retain young people. And I shouldn't limit it to young people. Uh, this is everybody. Something else we've learned is that folks that are 35 and under or 30 and under in some cases and then 50 or 55 and older, those folks want exactly the same things. They just use them at different times of the day. So we're building for those two worlds at the moment. We're also built for the people like myself who have young kids. Uh, mostly selfishly. But we create pro formas for the businesses. We figure out the capital stack of how, we, how it's going to be paid for. We can fundraise for those dollars and actually get them there. We create job descriptions and we hire the people in the community to run these things. It could be a nonprofit or a for-profit. Uh, we create the vision for the community. We create solutions to improve workforce development, cultural assessment, and we incentivize young people to come to the town. Essentially, it boils down to show us your empty buildings, and we will figure out what to do with them. And we love doing that. Uh, the process is visioning sessions. We build the business plans and pro formas. We figure out the money. We figure out how to get it moving, and then we implement it. This is a, a picture of one of the visioning sessions. I think this is in Fort Dodge. Uh, so extremely well attended. This is something that we want to look for in every community is engagement. This is the biggest metric I look for, is that how engaged are the community up front? So I mentioned incentives for young people, and this is a model that we're beginning to play with right now. People to go somewhere, and they don't want to have to pay them. And that's a unique model that we're trying to figure out. So I'm sorry, Zach. Could you just repeat that last sentence? You were you're cut out. Maybe you're a little too close to your mic, and I think this is such oh, a critical thing. So just at the beginning of the slide, what, what people, what the incentives are. Sure. Um, well, let me let me run through the example of the incentives. Is that coming through okay, Fran? Yeah, that sounds great now. Thank you. Sorry, okay, great. So here's how it works. So let's say that a place needs uh, public school teachers. They're having trouble uh, attracting, retaining high-quality public school teachers, which, which most small communities have an issue. So the school district does not typically does not have enough money to incentivize them. They can't pay above what they're already paying. The community may not have those dollars. So instead, we're putting it on the private developers or the people doing the projects that I'm working on. So in the case of Fort Dodge, in that massive building that we're working on, what we're looking to do is we're going to make a deal with folks and say this. Okay, we're going to take $40,000 out of that $60 million project and put it to the side. And that's enough money to do four of these a year for three years. So if you agree to move to Fort Dodge, and become a public school teacher for at least three years, and you live in our building, we're going to do two things right away. Number one, we're going to underwrite your rent by $200 a month. On top of that, we're going for every year you stay in Fort Dodge, we're going to pay down your student loans $1,000 a year. In exchange for you 
taking the three-year commitment to teach. You live in our building, which is where you're going to want to live anyway, because there'll be modern rental units. And we don't want to just give them free dollars. So the dollar value that we're offering them, we're saying they have to do community service hours that equal the amount of money that we're paying them. And we're doing this purposefully so that we embed them in the community. The goal, of course, is at the end of three years, if 20% of them say, you know, I kind of like Fort Dodge, I think I'm going to stick around. They're going to get married. They're going to buy a house. They're going to shop locally. They're going to start a business. They're going to have a child. Every child they have is $6,000 into the community school system. I would argue that that's better ROI, that initial amount of $40,000, that's way better ROI than a $40, $50 million tax incentive for a company that may or may not create the jobs they say they will. And so it doesn't have to be public school teachers. It could be any profession. Plumbers, electricians, lawyers, doctors, dentists. There's a great dental program here right now that works very similarly to this. And, and of course, artists. We'll come back to that later. But this is a way to incentivize people to come there and actually have them, ideally, fall in love with the community. The next part of this is how do you get this housing built? And so a scaled-down version of the massive Fort Dodge project that we're working on, let's say that you have an empty building in your downtown and it's two or three stories and maybe it's got an amenity on the first floor and the upper floors are vacant, maybe not. Or maybe we're even building new. Either way, let's say it's $3 million to do the build out. And the developer happens to be half a million dollars short in their capital stack to do it. And this is exactly why there is no development in rural America. It's not because there is there's no demand. There's insane demand. There's no, the development's not happening because they can't make the dollars match. The cost of build doesn't equal the cost of what they're going to get in rent. And the only way to do it at the moment is by utilizing low-income tax credits, and that's fine, but those are difficult to get. It locks the developer into 30 years of not changing the rent, and a lot of communities don't want to utilize them. So that's a challenge. So our model is a hybrid like this. What we're saying is that half million dollars that they're short, instead condo the building, sell the first floor of the building to a nonprofit that we will create, let's say it's a daycare center or an art gallery or a restaurant or a live music venue or any of these amenities the town could need. We will create the amenity. We will raise that half million dollars for the build out of that amenity. That makes the developer whole. And now at the end of the day, you've got 20 new rental units upstairs and a brand new amenity the town could use on the first floor. And so that's the model that we're playing with. Those numbers, of course, are an example. Everything, every town will be different. But we believe this can work to really remake our downtowns in a very practical way. So on a higher scale, coastal living, where I used to live, I do that every entrepreneur that lives on either coast of this country, and if they're in their late 20s or early 30s, especially if they've got kids, if they haven't quote unquote made it, meaning they're not a millionaire, I guarantee you most of those people are actively looking to leave. And some of them can't bring themselves to do it. They may never do it, but they've definitely been thinking about it. And they are leaving, and that's what the statistics show. And they're going across the country, but this is where they're going as of the last decade. In Iowa, you got one county, Polk County, where I live, that has any migration coming in. The rest of the country is blank. This is where they're going. And at the moment, the big ones, of course, are Minneapolis and Kansas City and Denver and Austin and Nashville. You know, 30, 40 years ago, it was Seattle, San Francisco, a little bit less than that, it was Portland. These cities become oversaturated. So those cities got oversaturated. Right now, I would argue every city I mention is probably oversaturated, Nashville, Austin, Denver, and so on. And so people are beginning to go to other cities like Des Moines. And this is my prediction that over the next five to ten years, many of these cities are going to become oversaturated, which will give way to places like Des Moines, Boise, Tulsa, Columbus, Ohio, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Omaha, Pittsburgh, a lot of these places that are beginning to experience the growth now. They're going to become oversaturated. Right now in downtown Des Moines, which is hard to think, especially if you live in a larger city, downtown Des Moines, it was actually came out this morning that Des Moines, Iowa, is the fastest-growing metro in the entire Midwest, beating out Chicago, Minneapolis, Kansas City, and St. Louis. We added 33 people a day in 2016. That's a big number for a place like Des Moines. The metro is growing to over 600,000 people. 
right now in the next five years, you're not going to be able to be 25 years old and find an affordable apartment downtown. So they're going to get pushed out. So naturally, they're going to begin going other places. And at that point, what's left? And it's really just rural areas. And this is true in every state. These are cities in Iowa, Fort Dodge, Davenport, Mason City, Dubuque, Burlington. All of these cities have at least 25,000 people in it. But that's going to be the next generation. And so we need to begin planning for that. But there's other things that we can be doing. So we also have to think about that we've got this opportunity, but, but rural America has a major opportunity sitting in front of it. And whether you agree with it or not, uh, for the first time in over 100 years, rural America elected a president. That's a big deal. And so the entire country is looking at rural right now, trying to figure out why did that happen. Many of us know why that happened, but they're trying to figure out why, and they're looking at it. And so we have maybe a 12, 18-month window right now to be bold until the next election cycle comes around and everybody becomes obsessed with that. So what are we going to do with that? How do we take advantage of that? So a couple thoughts. These are quotes from a few people in the technology world. And it's all about driverless and pilotless vehicles. And I'm sure many, many of you have heard about these things or maybe even been in one. But take a second and look through these quotes just for, just for a second here. So here's what one of them, one of those cars might look like. This is a Mercedes. And to get a little bit of a closer look at that, you've got this. The reason why I bring this up is because as this technology comes on board, which is clearly going to happen, you're going to be able to commute while working and, of course, work virtually, which many people do now. Because of technologies like this and others, metro areas are going to grow. Now, this is a poorly designed map by myself of central Iowa, right there in the middle uh, where the B is, is, the, is Des Moines. And that sort of yellow ring around Des Moines is the current metro area of Des Moines. If you drew a circle around all of these blue lines that I created, I believe by 2030 or 2035, this is going to be the metro area of Des Moines. And it goes all the way up to Fort Dodge, which is an hour and a half north. And right now, most metro areas are built on a 45-minute commute as far away as 45 minutes. That's the edge. I think it's going to double over the next 20 years. And if that's true, people are going to go to the communities that have the amenities they want. And it's not rocket science. They want live music venues. They want a cultural scene. They want a walkable downtown. They want a good martini. They want a brewery. They want modern rental units. If they've got kids, they want a strong daycare facility and places for them to play. They want a great trail system, parks and recreation, citywide beautification, a couple good restaurants. This is what they want. This is what I want. And so if you can turn these communities into these things, these are the communities that are going to reap the benefits of this grand shift that I believe is going to happen. Lastly, we need new industries for rural America. And if we're going to play with these massive ideas and, and bring people there, there's got to be interesting new jobs for them. Sometimes they'll create them, but other times they need to come there for them having already been there. And so if steel is going to be replaced by synthetics by 2030, which is what a lot of futurists predict, we're going to see a ton of blue-collar jobs go away. And I want you to look closely at this house here. I want you to see if you notice anything odd about this house, other than the giant crane behind it. This house was one of the first houses in the world, in China, that was 3D printed. And this house is almost 3,000 square feet, and it was printed in less than a day. And it's built by this thing that essentially squirts out a concrete synthetic in under three hours to build the base of the house. And apparently, if you wait a couple more hours, it'll do your plumbing and electrical. This is the next big phase of home building and buildings being built. This is happening all over the world, but it is not happening in America. No structure has been 3D printed in America just yet. It's happening all over China and Southeast Asia. It's happening in the Middle East, but not here yet. And largely, that's due to uh, urban areas and their city codes and their zoning laws, which is going to take a decade or more to work through to do stuff like this. Plus, if you can print a home in three hours, there's not enough housing inspectors to inspect the houses. 
that's another issue. And I think there's a link to a video that uh, uh, Fran's going to share later that shows exactly how this works. So if that's the case, doesn't that make a really good reason for rural America to take full advantage of this? You've got lots of land that's uh, inexpensive to purchase. It, you can experiment. You've got a workforce there. Plus, the most important factor, you've got city governments and county governments that can be way more nimble than urban areas, and they can change their laws overnight. And so this is an industry that rural America could take hold of and harness and own and bring tons of job growth and economic growth and population growth to their communities. We need to be preparing our cities for 30 years from now. Not that we're not doing anything between now and 30 years. We're going to do a lot. But this is the goal. Sometime between now and 30 years, that wave is going to break, and people are going to be going out to rural areas on a regular basis. But again, they're only going to go to the ones that are welcoming to the next generation with the amenities that they're looking for. So that's creative placemaking. That's creating the unique. And uh, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, everyone, so much. Awesome. A wild applause across North America and beyond, Zach. Thank you so much. Just so much rich information. And uh, one of the questions was, how do I get in touch with Zach? So there you go. That was the information. And you can look at this uh, whole, whole presentation again to find, to actually absorb some of this fantastic information that Zach has given us. We are now going to go to our uh, Q&A, but Zach did mention the 3D printed house. It's a remarkable video that, that shows a house uh, being created. Um, uh, actually, I think it's, it's in Russia, but it's a remarkable uh, video. There are two other links, one to the Des Moines Social Club, which he founded, and also a wonderful article about Des Moines and, and how it moved from um, being I guess people might have called it dull, and it certainly is far from that uh, these days. So thank you so much, Zach. Let's get to the questions. Oh, one of the first ones that came in, we'll get to some that also have been written in, and we thank the people that have already sent in some questions. But Karen from Minnesota asked if there are common readiness factors that you saw in communities willing to make investments and strategies like you were talking about. Um, and, and I think you've talked about some of the barriers, but maybe you can also mention, you know, what are, what are some issues you also run across that, that slow this process down? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and, and one that we had ourselves last year. And so we developed a, a rubric uh, and sort of a um, criteria list of what could make a great, uh, the, the most ideal city for us to do our work in. And we quickly found out that, you know, there's no formula for this. Um, we can, there are there are some things that are really good indicators. So here they are. Uh, are they a county seat? Uh, do they have a college, community college, community college out, uh, branch, something like that? Uh, do they have a hospital? Uh, do they have more than three major employers outside of the public sector in terms of the public schools or public hospitals? Um, has, there, has there been steady or slight in, incline in their population growth over the last decade? So those are quick things we can find out right off the bat. Um, the major, there's a lot of other specific questions we ask about what their civic engagement is. We ask about what their cultural amenities are. We say things like, what are the top things to do on a Saturday night? Uh, what's your favorite non-chain restaurant? Uh, where can I get a really good um, craft beer? Where can I get a good martini? Uh, you know, things like that. But the biggest one is engagement. And so what we do when a community contacts us and they want us to, to potentially do work with them, we send them this survey that takes no longer than a half hour to fill out and ask a lot of the questions I just mentioned. And typically it's a chamber, uh, somebody with the chamber or the city council or the county government or a local foundation or sometimes a local business owner that will reach out to us. And we say you should be able to answer this survey in less than a half hour and get it back to us quickly. And so the first thing we look at is how long does it take them to get it back to us? So one of two things, one of three things happen. Either they do what we ask and they get it back to us quickly, which is great, or they sit on it forever and forget, which is an indication that may not work there, or they dive way too deeply into it. They ask way too many questions of too many people, and it becomes a little bureaucratic. The first one is what we're looking for. And so if we get back, if we get it back in a timely manner and it has a lot of the uh, answers that we're looking for, we will agree to come out and do a site visit. 
And at the site visit, we asked for a cross-section of the community from students to stay-at-home parents to business owners to retired folks to just about everybody uh, to come in. And we want them to, we, we ask them a ton of questions. We more interview them than they interview us. And if we feel that there is full engagement at that, present, at that meeting, that's when we will decide to engage with that community. Um, but even then, it's still not, we still don't know. And a good example, there was a community of 1,500 people that I worked in my first project here uh, early last year. And great project, wonderful people that on the outset that brought me in. But when we started doing our visioning sessions, we had an average of six people come to the visioning sessions. And then right off the bat, after the third one, I, I was like, you know, this may not work. And what we quickly found out is a lot of people in the community didn't want that community to change. And so there's not a lot of work we can do with some of those types of communities, but those, that, those they're few and far between. Well, well Zach, that brings me um, actually to a, a question that John in Ohio had and Len in Connecticut about this is about visioning and listening and how you've done that. So you've described that a little bit. Then there's also, you know, in, in what ways – has creative placemaking involved marginalized sectors of a community? And then Rachel even just called and said, how, how are you sure that the visioning sessions are representative? Do you just, if there are just six people there, maybe there aren't uh, there. How do you make sure that the marginalized section uh, sectors of the community are involved and that they're also being represented? And uh, does creative placemaking include them? There's, there's two ways to go about it. Um, I'll give you my preferred way first. The preferred way is to do the meeting, like I said before, where we ask, we have a, a list of types of people we want in the room. And typically, these folks are low-hanging fruit. These are the people that have been working their butts off for the net last 20 years to try to change that community. So ultimately, we know they, they are going to help us do the work we need to do. And we interview them, and then we do an interview session with that we open to the public but we do strategic pieces. So as an example, I'm going to go to the town of Fayette in two weeks, and that's a town of 1,100 people in northeast Iowa, and they have Upper Iowa University there that has just about as many students as that live in the town. And there's a major divide between the university and the downtown of Fayette. Both are great, but they're not working well together. And so what we're, we've asked for are several different visioning sessions right off the bat. We have one that we're doing with the student body. We have one that we're doing with downtown uh, business owners. We have one that we're doing with civic leaders. We have one that we're doing re with restaurateurs. And we have one that we're doing that's a catch-all for the entire public where we say anybody and everybody can come. Those are often the, where we get the most genuine feedback mm. and information that we need. So in a town the size of Fayette, it's likely that I will personally interview half of the community over my time, the six to eight months of work, that I will do there. So mm -hmm. that's the process. We don't, we don't, if we marginalize anybody, it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, well and Karen in Minnesota is asking, is it more the, are you finding that the next generation leaders or is it more the traditional players driving this we, this work? Who do you see taking the lead or is it a combination, ideally? It's, it's, a, it's a combination and ideally it's a combination. But what we're finding is the folks who have been doing it forever uh, have kind of thrown up their hands. Uh, so, you know, the term of creative placemaking, the idea of it, it's only been around a little more than a decade. I would imagine that 10, 15 years ago, if I showed up in a town and said, hey, art can save your community, I'd probably get laughed out of town. Uh, and that still kind of happened. Um, but today, a lot of these communities are saying, well, you know, we've tried a lot of options, and some of them have worked a little bit, but none of them really have been catalytic. We need to think differently. So they're, they're open almost by default to a lot of different ideas in a good way. And then the next generation of people are the one who are, ones who are really driving this. The problem in a lot of these communities, though, is that the next generation of folks are not living there. They've already left town. They live in larger metros. And so sometimes, like the case of Algona in far northern Iowa, we when my visioning session is there, they actually asked, uh, young people who are from Algona to come back from Des Moines and Omaha and Minneapolis for these sessions. And it was people that would consider living in Algona again, but only if mm. these amenities were built there. So that was a very productive visioning session that we got to do with them. 
Fantastic. Well, and that takes me to uh, Michael is interested in what entrepreneurs can do to accelerate creative placemaking in their community. Um, and since we're speaking of entrepreneurs, I'm also, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to combine a few of these. People, of course, are interested in sources of funding, and Sam just wrote, you know, he's really interested in how you finance those incentives to get people, teachers or whatever, back in. Um, is, you know, where do you get that money? I mean, it, it seems like you put aside part of the $6 million for that, very well spent. Um, but he's wondering, is there any policy strategy, or is it all financial, and does it come from entrepreneurs or the town? Where do you get that agreement to put that money aside for some of those incentives you were talking about? So first thing I want to say is money is never the problem. Money is a hurdle. If the idea is solid and if the community is behind it, the money will be found, period. It might take a while, but the money will always be there, and people cannot get hung up on how much these things cost. Uh, to, to build whatever it is that, that they want to build. The money will always be there, but specifically about how do you get the money and, and how do the entrepreneurs work for it. The first thing I would do if I was an entrepreneur in these communities, I would go to the local banks, and I would not ask for a regular loan. I, in fact, I would start with credit unions if, they're, if they exist there, um, or community banks, ideally. And I would go in and, and explain what it is that you want to do and how it will benefit the community, and they will ultimately get that because they have the same problems that you have. They need people living there. And so if you can figure out a way to help them drive more people to come to the community, they will pay for it. And this was true when I got here to Des Moines. I moved here. I didn't know anybody. And I started talking to massive companies like Wells Fargo and Principal Financial and Meredith Corporation and Pioneer Hybrid. And they all had problems with talent attraction and retention. And I said, look, if you help me get this project off the ground, it's not a donation. It's an investment in your community. That's what you have in your company. That's what you have to be looking at. And, and it worked. But these smaller communities, I would go to these banks. Ideally, you can get a donation. But if not, there are very low interest microloans to get. Uh, or you can pull resources and say, look, if these five banks in my 60-mile radius all put $25,000 into a pot, we can do something significant. And that's not a lot of money for a lot of these banks. And many of them will be responsive to that, especially if you sell them on the idea of what you're trying to do, which is good for the community. There's always money out there. You can look at municipal utilities have uh, revolving loan funds. USDA has, at least they used to have, maybe they hopefully still will, uh, revolving loan funds as well. Great. Uh one, one, and let's not get too political, but a lot of people are concerned about cuts happening, and it sounds like you're really looking at there are local places you can go for the money. Yes. Even and, if, and even if the federal money is not there. Yes. I mean, number one, no project ever is 100% public funded. So that's, that's number one. There's always going to be need to be investment locally, and there should be. And I, I personally, I don't think there should any, ever be more than 10 or 20% on the capital side, uh, and that's, that's high, really 10% of your capital project that should be funded publicly. If you can't support it privately, then it's not going to work. But even more so than that, you have to create revenue. And if you look at the, the world of nonprofits versus foundations to support them will never match up. And so you have to create a different system. The social club worked because we were able to get, in a very short period of time, to 70% earned revenue. So we raised 30%, and of that 30, maybe 5%, probably less, is pub are public dollars. We had to figure that other way out first. So if all public money goes away, that'll suck, um, but we'll get by. But even if it doesn't, I don't think it'll ever fully disappear. Hopefully it doesn't. Um, no. But we have to understand there's other avenues to find the dollars. And uh, Jennifer wants to know how, how you engage local artists or – or seek to attract artists from outside. Clearly, you you did this in Des Moines. How how do you in, specifically engage the artists? And every, every community has artists. Uh, most of them, in a lot of places that are smaller, may not be visible. They might be doing their work in their homes and not really showing it to anybody or whatever that is. Um, but you have to find them. And if you live in the community, you know who they are. And it's it's not that difficult to find them. The you begin talking to them specifically, say, what do you need? So 
here's an, uh, a real life example in Des Moines. Uh, we had two aerial artist circus performers that were incredibly talented. They had no space in the city to work, and so they did 90% of their work outside of Iowa because it didn't exist there. And so we said, what do you need? They said, really, we just need a room with 18-foot ceilings. That's it. And we ran the numbers on what we could do if we started a, a class program with them and could it support the social club and also support them, and it turned out to work beautifully. And there are uh, – tons of students that take those classes, all because we were able to give them a room. Uh, I'm a very big believer in residency programs. Rural America needs to take way more advantage of this. Uh, a great one in Omaha is certainly not rural, but in Omaha there's the Bemis Center, and they do a program where it's for visual artists, it's three months long, if you apply and get in, you have free room and board for three months, you get a $750 a month stipend to live on, you get use of their facilities to make the work you make. At the end of your time, you showcase it in the museum and you go home. What do they do when they go home? They tell everybody how amazing Omaha is. But that program has almost a seven-year international waiting list to get into. It's super competitive. And there need to be more programs like the Bemis around the country and in rural areas. And I'm trying to build them within a 45-minute to an hour drive of larger metros where Artists, as, as is the case of Soho, New York, 70, 80 years ago, uh, Brooklyn, 50 years ago, artists will, are always pushed to the fringes out of necessity. So they're going to go there anyway. If we can make it a little bit attractive for them, they'll actually stick around. And, and so even some of these residency programs, do some of the artists stay, decide to move Absolutely. there? Absolutely. Yes. It happens. There aren't enough of them really happening. There are several. There's a great one in Grinnell called Green City. Grinnell is a small town in Iowa. There's, men, there's, there's some. In, there's there's ones in every state, but they're of course underfunded. Um, uh, many don't have the management that they need because people are working three jobs running these things. But if you can combine them with residential units and putting a for-profit business in the space that pays rent, that is your uh, regular revenue source. That's how you build these things. This is what I work on largely in a lot of these communities. Many communities want me to come and help them build a residency program, and I love doing that. Well, Carrie in, in New Mexico and also Tony in Michigan are interested in how to incorporate creative placemaking into the design of long-range plans like comprehensive plans. Have you seen some good examples of that? Yeah. Um, the city of uh, – of San Antonio did that really wonderfully with their downtown river walk. Um, Oklahoma City uh, did this when they went towards a complete streets program. Um, rural areas, it's not has not often happened. Uh, one I will mention is uh, is happening right now in Winona, Minnesota, uh, where Matt Fluharty is. He runs Art of the Rural. Um, they're taking a long term approach of what they can do with their community. Um, so it, it comes down to going and getting a seat at the table. If you live in these communities and you have ideas of what they need to become, go talk to the city council, talk to the downtown chamber, talk to the business owners. They are struggling, just like everybody else, to attract and retain talent for the, to the community. If you have ideas of how you can do that, go speak to them. Uh, of course, bring us out. I'm not the only person who does this. There's a lot of other great uh, uh, groups out there that do it. The thing I'm excited about with McClure Engineering, where I am now, is I now work with engineers and architects where we have a thing called a 360 program. We're going to do this in the town of Jefferson where we're doing creative placemaking. We're doing uh, rebuilding their sewer infrastructure. We're doing a complete streets programs. We're working with a company that helps to, uh, up their gradu high school graduation rates. We're uh, taking a look at how to beautify downtown and doing a housing study and, and doing actual housing development all as one shot. And that, I think, is the future because it's hard to do – 10 different contracts with 10 different companies, um, we're, we're beginning to partner with other groups to do a, a, this, what we call 360. Well, it was interesting that, that Chad wrote right right away, his question was, who owned that Warden Hotel property? Yeah. And that may or may not be relevant, but maybe was it the town? Was it, do you start there with, with owners of those properties or has the town taken it over? What what happens with those yeah, days? In that, in that case, the, uh, the city bought the property from the owner. The owner uh -huh. was clearly not, not doing what they needed to do. They bought it for a dollar, and now the city, yeah. you know, and they wouldn't have done it if they didn't believe there was a way to get rid of it because obviously the city doesn't want to continue to own it. Right, right. Um, 
Let me see. Anna in South Dakota and Amanda in Texas were wondering about assessment and, and data. Are, are you measuring the success of your work? We are measuring, yes. And all Many of the projects I mentioned are currently in flux. So they're not complete. They're all being worked on now. So, yes, we are measuring. And in the next 6 to 12 months, we should have some real data on uh, what kind of impact they had. And what would you say your greatest resource in the community to make these great redesign projects happen? In, in a way, you've talked about them, but is, is there is there one or two great resources in the community that you can speak to specifically? It's, it's never money. It's never uh, mm -hmm. funding. It's always a person. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's always a person or a group of people or a company that got together that said, we have to do something. And we're going to do what we can, what we know. And then they contact people like us to help them realize their ideas. The ideas that we bring, they're never our ideas. They're always the ideas from the community. All we do is say, hey, we've done these before. Here's some ways to make that happen. We'll show you avenues to find the money. We'll actually go get the money for you if you want us to. We'll get the thing open if you want us to. But ultimately, the idea has to come from the community itself. And uh, we're, we're getting near the end, but I'm, I'm going to throw one more in be, before your last remarks. Uh, this is Frank from Virginia and a couple other people interested in tips for finding and recruiting young entrepreneurs. So we've talked about They're, attracting young people in general and some amenities, but those young entrepreneurs who are willing to risk it all in a way. Well, you know, entrepreneurs can work from anywhere. As long as you've got a good Internet signal, it doesn't matter. Uh, ideally, there's fiber in that town, so you're not going to, you know, the signal won't go down. Um, but just yesterday, I had a conversation with two groups that want to teach um, rural students how to code. And mm. so if we were able to do that, which we're actively talking about now, you know, we're building the 3D house builders of tomorrow in these communities that are right there. But if you're an entrepreneur and you are, you have a wonderful idea for whatever it is you want to do, but you're struggling to pay the rent and your basic, uh, you know, lifestyle because you live in a larger city. I was that person in Brooklyn. Um, get out. Go. You take the shot and go to somewhere that, you know, it, you don't hate, but you need to – that has some of the amenities you want, but probably not all of them. You'll find a very inexp inexpensive place to live comparatively, and you can get to work. And they're, they, they will welcome you with open arms because – they are looking for the next generation to join them. So don't stay in the big cities. In fact, if you're an artist and your goal is not making money or fame, the last place you should be is the large metropolitan area because all you're doing is just repeating what has come before you. There are thousands of other people, millions of other people, doing exactly what you're doing. And don't kid yourself that you're so incredibly unique. And you can be unique, but it's going to take you – a lifetime to stick out and be the unique person you are in those communities, whereas a community that's smaller, you're going to be way more unique. You're going to have much larger impact right away, and it's going to have a larger impact on you. And if your goal as an artist is to make a change in the world or your community, then you should be in a smaller community trying to do that work. And you are the perfect example of that. It's really, it's, it, yours is such a fabulous story. So thank you so much, Zach, for this. Um, I'm just going to offer any final thoughts for helping folks get started in creative placemaking in small towns. So maybe back to summarizing the amenities or, or what, what can they do next week to just, okay, we're going to, we're going to get going. We're inspired by Zach. We're going to do this. A um, couple things. Obviously, go talk to the city leaders and, and share your ideas. But if you want to make a bold statement, um, go to your busy street and um, get one of the parking places on the corner and uh, turn it into a living room. And sit there and on a Saturday and host people over and read books or watch television or do whatever it is you do. But do something completely out of the ordinary that makes the whole community go, whoa, what's going on here? And you need a catalytic shift. And we did that in Des Moines where we, start, we, did, we threw an event. We threw something called the Subjective Circus, which was a, a bunch of local performers, a lot of music, visual artists, and so on, that performed from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. in an empty building. And that's how we got people to notice what we were doing. Talk to your newspapers. 
uh, local newspapers are the ones that are doing well compared to the larger newspapers in the nation. Uh, they will print articles about what your ideas are. Go talk to the editors. Write letters to the editor. Get it out there. But that stuff you can do right away. Awesome. Zach, this has been a wonderful, wonderful hour. Can't thank you enough for this informative, engaging webinar, for spending some time with us and caring so much about rural America. Um, we wish you continued success in all your endeavors. Thank you so much. Well, thank you guys for the opportunity, and, and thank you, everybody, for, for listening. It would be wonderful to meet you one day. All right. It was awesome. I also want to thank uh, CERD, the Citizen Institute on Rural Design, and the Orton Family Foundation who make these sessions possible. We hope you take a moment to fill out the survey provided at the link on the Adobe Connect page. We're particularly interested to hear what you learned from today's webinar and your preferences for time of day for future events. We were very impressed by the numbers uh, in this particular webinar, so maybe um, also the timing works well. A recording of this webinar will be sent to all registrants and posted at our website, www.orton.org. You'll find more resources there. And you can also go to the third website, which is rural underscore design dot org. We hope you join us in April when we will explore local philanthropy and how you can find new investors in your town. So all of those with the money questions, if they weren't completely answered, please tune in next month. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good luck with your innovative and creative placemaking. See you next time. Bye-bye.